First time I had an introduction with my proper pronunciation of my name. <laughs> Thank you. I'm German. Let's say. <laughs> and I'm not. I'm Swedish. But, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I'm, I'm going to be very specific kicking off today that I'm going to talk about from a specific role's point of view. So, uh, and that role is the CIO. And I think the CIO is a very important person in the institution still even though there's a lot of threat out there. But I think it's our job as CIOs to translate the needs of the institutions into actual services that work. So that's the point of view I start with when I uh, go forward here. But first I want to give you an image that was given to me by one of the teachers uh, I did this kind of presentation for. <coughs> and it actually resonated very deeply with me. Because when she saw our hype cycle, and our hype cycle, with in this case 49 technologies on it, she saw a veritable tsunami hitting the classroom. And I actually had friends who had been in the tsunami of Thailand way back. So I can, for me that was a very, very strong image. And I could really see how that hit her. And I thought that is really what's going to be my job, to help people to manage all this massive flood of information and to navigate these tough waters into real services for education. Since we've started doing these kind of things, we've noticed that these things are not, the tsunami is not really the key trend. The key trends are much deeper affecting the whole of society but also the roles we have as uh, education technologies. So there's really an organization centricity change versus people centricity change. And you can see how consumerization and free services are actually changing the balance of power. And of course, the death of distance in many forms, not only the internet, doing the same. And I might say many forms, and it's an interesting anecdote. You know, we Swedish people, we love uh, herring especially pickled herring. But it turns out it's so expensive filleting that herring in Sweden. So what we do, we catch it in the Nordic Sea, we put it in con containers, send it to Thailand, have it filleted, and then send it back in order to pickle it. That's how inexpensive it's come to send things around the world. So what really is happening here on a much deeper level of society is we need to ask ourselves, who has the control of the means of production and distribution? And I, I think I'm very close to the center where those words actually were written down. And you, usually I ask about this, but I'm quite sure that you know this man, Karl Marx. <coughs> and why do I have him there? Well, because I think there is a revolution happening out there. But it's a very different revolution from the last time. And it's definitely impacting the roles of the CIO as the central dispenser of resources. <coughs> because very often what we see is, in terms of the CIO, we look at the guys who like the wall garden, slow chains, alignment to institution. We deliver Blackboard and Moodle, Microsoft Office, or Godzilla, the site, those all these sort of institution-based systems, but what do the, them want? The end users. Open things, like can change, communal choice. WordPress instead of Blackboard. Sotero instead of the uh, Word uh, Office. Google App, Microsoft Live, PubWorks. And do you see something specific there? Almost none of those is actually delivered by this area or the institution. So, this balance of power, actually that tension has always been there, in a sense. And way back, even when I was a CIO, and I'm now with a company called Gardner, you can Google that and see what happens. I have this very simple matrix, because I like, I'm a visual learner. I like to have visual stuff when I, when I discuss things. So, this very simple matrix, I take my services, look at functionality, specific to general, uh, need, local to global. And the first thing I do is go, go to the faculty and ask them, you know, what are the stuff I shouldn't meddle with? What are the stuff that you really need to have total freedom with? And being a, a research chemist to start with, 
Yeah, I do need my eight different chemistry programs to model uh, all random molecules. There's no way I can standardize the one. However, I don't mind if you run my computer, make it upgrade, with security patches, whatever. That's okay. On the other hand, I really need to have a talk with my IT people. Because there are some stuff that are so general and global, it should be outsourced. And the obvious example today is, of course, email. It, especially when Microsoft and Google, you know, give it away for free. So why should we do it? So we have to find the sweet spot here. Where do we add value? Because we know the institution. We understand how it is to be a teacher and researcher in the institution. And I thought I had time. And then the cloud. And then consumerization. If I don't give a service to my end users quickly enough, sure they go directly into the cloud and do Microsoft. And these things are actually, I'm not just talking about the Soteros and the Men Mendeleys and the Magmas and stuff. I'm actually talking about stuff that are really hitting our core competency, if you will. So if a researcher comes to me and says, uh, well, you know, I need uh, 10 instances of Linux, uh, could you give it to me within two days? I'll probably say, well, sorry, I need about five days, but I'll, I'll, I'll get it to you. Okay. That same researcher takes his uh, account at Google, uh, at Amazon, sorry, its Kindle account, and actually goes in and buys 10 instances of uh, uh, Linux for two cents an hour per CPU. Within seconds. So that's the stuff I need to relate to going forward. So really, what is the role of the CIO in the future of the consumerized cloud? Well, I'll give you a crash course in enterprise architecture here. Especially we, we um, IT people, we're a bit left-brained, you know. We, we like structure because, you know, let's face it, IT is really stupid too. It only does what you program it to do and connect it to do, that kind of thing. So ideally for us, if you know the processes at the top level, you can map uh, your systems to those processes and then you support it with the bottom plate of generic infrastructure. And generic is even including not only network, email, and stuff like that, but also office packages. And some things that everybody uses. So, what am I supposed to be? Do you want me to be the chief infrastructure officer? Just making sure that there's connectivity out there? Or do you want me to be the chief integration officer? Or is there really a place for the chief information officer where I, with my knowledge of the future stuff out there, can go in and change the processes of the institution. I know there's a perceived value increase going upwards. Do you think there is? Or is it just a stop block in your needs for future and better technology? Or do we have a role to play? Actually, I think we do have a role to play. Because one of the main problems when you do microsourcing is that very often you reduce the possibility to collaborate between people because if you use all different kinds of services, then you very often cannot exchange information. So there is actually something in there which is very close to the chief integration <coughs> system. But we still have to prove that we can be the chief information officer. So, here's the hype cycle for education 2011. 49 technologies, the crash course in the hype cycle. There's a technology trigger, something happens, the press gets hold of it, it rockets up to the peak of inflated expectations. <coughs> then somebody actually starts using it. And it plummets down to the trough of dissolution. And somebody hangs in there, usually a very tenacious uh, teacher or the IT department or something. And we start climbing the slope of enlightenment going into the plateau of productivity. And it turns out that we started using this in Gartner 1995. And some claim that we invented it. I don't quite believe that, but I at least we've made very good use of the hype cycle. 
It actually is something you need to understand is we do stop looking at things when they reach about 20% of the intended market share. So it's only really loaded technologies we follow in this case. But for me, when I do this education version, which is 49 technology profiles, 49 out of 1,864 technology profiles we cover in this format. Because we have, I have a 649 other analyst colleagues who are also doing this kind of technology profile. But when I do this mix, I try to think of this as a tech toolbox for the CIO. What are those technologies that actually make the most sense using for the future? And this is the near future, very often. And I also try to use things like trends, felicities. And to this time, at this time we have consumerization, is a big thing. Things like campus app store, model definitely on the idea of the app store, Apple app store. Uh, gamification. A lot of researchers actually did fold it, which you know, I mean it's a way of folding proteins that better, uh, using humans to fold protein, which is actually better when the computer can do it. Uh, obviously things like mobile sp uh, smartphone, or things that have gone further, like game consoles, as media hubs, stuff like that. Another trend we see is definitely sourcing. There are a lot of different sourcing options here. Obviously we have cloud things, like cloud email for staff and faculty. And by the way, Cloud email for students, <coughs> way over there. In the US, it's more than 50% of the institutions already do that. We have other things like cloud payments, computing, uh, computing as a service, a, a actually a democratizer of research within higher education. You don't have to be Edinburgh anymore to afford these kind of things. But obviously also things like open source, open source middleware, open source financials, open source e-learning applications. That is also sourcing options. <coughs> and finally, which is I think very important to understand going forward, we need to understand standards and how they apply to our uh, environment. Student information systems, international data interoperability standards, so there is actually a standard out there which is called metadata for learning objectives, learning opportunities, sorry. The whole idea is to actually make the Bologna process work. <coughs> so you get the right learning opportunity, the right course that matches your need. Things like that. You of course have very technical standards as well. You know, if you don't constantly upgrade to the latest version of the wireless standard, you're going to have problems. And a lot of you probably have when the iPad and iPhone came to your campus. Of course, a lot of this is not just one standard. So the wireless as a service here is also driven by uh, consumerization. Or uh, learning stack is very much a sourcing standard. Or buy your own device <coughs> strategy is also uh, run by standards, and not the source, only a sourcing option. But, as you can see, and usually when I have more than, than uh, 20 minutes, we have a longer discussion about this. But I really sincerely want you to do your own hype cycle. Because the hype cycle is always going to be relative to your institution where you are. There's one problem though with the hype cycle. And the hype cycle doesn't give you any information about strategic relevance. <coughs> it's just expectation of visibility. It's just time or maturity in this case. So what I've done is that I've looked at another very uh, visible tension between the faculty and the institution. And I call it uh, organizational efficiency versus personal <coughs> productivity. Because let's face it, even though we IT people like this thing, structure, or you know, we want to have a, a good template to build from. Most of the people who actually work at the higher education institution, they are there because they do not want to be a good corporate citizen. They want their total freedom. So, what we used to do, using support processes uh, and, and standardizing uh, what is called organizational efficiency, and even when we did education, which is core mission of the institution, we did course management systems. And you hear, it's not really a pedagogical tool, it's a course management system. 
what we really need to do is go to supporting research and education, doing things like social recall, doing things like instant visualization, and of course augmented collaboration. And actually, when I started doing this some five years ago, this hadn't stopped doing, but now we have immense tools to start doing this actually. We just have to leverage it within our institutions. So what we do, is we use something called the uh, stra uh, strategic technology map, which is very simple. Good for the organization up here, good for the individual down there. Here, corporate green light, you have things like ERP system, financial system, student information system, the CFO loves them, chief financial officer. Here you have the iPads, the media, uh, the social media things, media tablets, stuff like that. Here, we have a lot of the things that we love as CIOs. It's identity and access management, networks, families, stuff like that. It turns out that if you combine these two things, you very often get there. And what we do is actually we take the information from the hype cycle. And we use the color coding, so red is gold. And red is risk, green is gold. And we start looking, what kind of patterns can I see? And here's where the ecosystem thing starts coming in. So you take your homegrown e-learning e application, you take, you combine the social media, and you get the social learning platform. It's kind of straightforward and not really fun, but this one is fun. So I take the e-learning platform, go to cloud, office, media, tablet, social media, and e-textbook. And what do I get? Well, I get the cloud productivity, mobile social content platform. Okay, you start to get somewhere. We're starting to get uh, information in there. If I want people to be online and mobile and learn, I probably need to give them a wireless as a service because obviously they're going to learn in other places than the campus. And if I have a lot of things I want to put together, I need identity and access management, organization centers. And you can see if I also put in service-oriented architecture, we're talking technology here. I'm actually being able to plug and play and support these things. If I have SOA, I can do mashups more easily. If I'm starting to use resources from outside, I probably need federated identity and access management. And eventually I top it off with the learning stack. And what is the learning stack? Actually, there's a live example out there. The Open University of Catalonia, they realize we can't have this locked in, unflexible system. We need this way of folding. I like this origami thing here. You need to fold your services in different ways for different people and different devices. And they did that with technology again. They actually got something like service oriented architecture working with something called the service enterprise service bus. And with that technology, they did not have to choose between Sakai and Moodle. They could run both. And they could start plugging in Google and other web tools, and even running uh, WordPress down here internally. And the idea was to give the faculty the pedagogical tools they needed for their pedagogical style. So, to wind down here. Actually, this is not about finding the things that are up here. It's finding a balance between the things that make you want to be part of an organization, an institution, and the stuff that give you personal instant creativity. And again, it's about doing your own personal strategic technology map because it's not enough me telling you, and you know, those of you who are teachers know this. It's about internalizing it with the student, giving them tools to understand this. So the last slide here. I'm hoping I've given you two tools that can help you achieve this. Because I do know that in the UK specifically, there's an increasingly competitive environment. And I really hope that you can not only see what everyone else sees, but also think what nobody else thoughts, thinks about what everybody else sees. Thank you. Thanks, Jan Martin. Um, next up, we have Nick Skelton. Um, he's 
some mode of uh, 